If you're glad to be saved today, say amen. amen. Great to be in the house of God back here to Cleveland Baptist Church. I can tell you and with all sincerity, and I know uh, people say things just out of rote or out of ritual, but I can say this with all sincerity. I believe this would be one of the greatest churches anywhere. I thank God for Cleveland Baptist. I appreciate so much your pastor. Brother Folger has been my good friend for many years now, and uh, we have uh, preached together, been together in meetings, laughed together, had great times together, cried a little bit together here and there, and uh, it has been such a blessing to watch the Folger family grow and uh, have watched the hand of God upon them. I came in this morning and saw Miss Denise, uh, one of the first per people I saw, and uh, she was holding uh, a little fella, Toby I believe it was, uh, their little grandson, and then I saw Sandra outside and, and I said, oh you have a little boy? She said, I don't know what to do with a little boy. Uh, we have all girls in the family as well. I'll tell you what, just keep your hand on them, and when it gets real bad, just give them to Brother Pete, and uh, he'll take care of them, amen? Uh, I love little boys. Uh, somebody described a little boy as noise with dirt on it, amen? And uh, So uh, you are blessed indeed. Uh, we have two little granddaughters and another one coming soon. And uh, So we've got uh, Kaylin and Hallie, and then Haven is coming, and uh, we're looking forward to that. And uh, my daughter called said, oh, Dad, I'm so sorry. It's a little girl. I said, sorry. I, I, you just bring all the little girls we can get. And uh, we love them. Thank God for them. And I would like to see a little fella in there somewhere. And uh, Sandra said, oh, she was worried that, uh, you know, he won't be manly enough. But uh, I think with Brother Folger around, he'll be just fine. Amen? And uh, he'll wrestle him and beat on him and all that. I loved having little boys. It was great Boy, having boys growing up. Uh, I won in everything. Amen? I could beat them in Nerf basketball and all that. One day they grew up, now they beat me in chess and basketball and everything else. But uh, it is wonderful to have uh, children. They really are a heritage of the Lord. I'm going to get right into the preaching this morning. I know some of you are worried about the weather, so I have a special verse just for you. First of all, let's turn over to Matthew chapter 7, please. Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 21. I guess you all can hear me okay. Good, all right. Matthew chapter 7, verse number 21. I heard about a church that they serve coffee at, toward the end of the service. And uh, wasn't that a blessing? They give everybody real good black, uh, de uh, heavy caffeinated coffee at the end of the service. Say, why? So they don't fall asleep while they're driving home after the service. But we'll try not to do that to you. I'll try to keep you awake. I don't advise falling asleep while I'm preaching. Wouldn't be good at all. Matthew chapter 7, please. And uh, I'll begin to read in verse number 21. But before I do, I'd like to read another verse from Hezekiah. Hezekiah 3.16. You say, that's not in the Bible. You're right. But if it was, this is what it would say. <laughs> thou shalt be in church tonight. If thou misseth church tonight, thy dishwasher shall break down, <laughs> thy pipes shall freeze, and thy cat shall run away. So we want all of you to be in church tonight. Do not miss church. I'm going to leave cats alone. Uh, some of you have already said, oh, you're going to talk about cats? That's it for the week. It's all done. Amen. How many of you believe that? <laughs> There's not one, uh, one hand up, Pastor. Not one person even raised their hand. Uh, you've got to have more faith than that. I have stopped uh, making fun of cats and all that. I, I had to. I've had so many people get upset with me, and I understand they're your little friend and all that, so I'm going to leave them alone this week uh, so you're safe. All the cat hater or cat lovers that are waiting for me, you can unfold your arms. You're going to have a good time and uh, preach the Word of God, and I'll try to stay in the Bible and stay off of the cats. How about an amen? amen. Some of you ought to say thank you or something like that. Uh, otherwise, I'll preach against them every week, every sermon. But uh, try to be here tonight if you can. I hope to preach on revival tonight, the Lord willing. I know the weather's a little bit bad uh, and all that, but uh, trust me, uh, this place is unbelievable. I got off the airplane, uh, walked out of the airport. It was freezing outside. And a uh, pastor said he'd be right around in a minute or two and get me. He got stuck in traffic in the airport. I was standing out there. I thought, you've got to be crazy to live around this place. And uh, it's unbelievable. It is cold every time I come to Cleveland. And uh, the Lord led us back to Baltimore uh, in December of 2012. 
uh, just in time for the world champion Baltimore Ravens to win the Super Bowl. And uh, we were there, and we loved it. It's, what's wrong? Uh, anyway, uh, we, uh, so we've enjoyed being there, and uh, you pray for us at Granite Baptist Church. It's amazing. I look out on the church family here, got to talk to folks, and uh, some of you are exactly the same people as Granite Baptist, only you live in Cleveland. And uh, I was talking to one man. I thought, man, I can't get away from this guy no matter how far I go. But anyway, uh, it is great uh, to be back in the church house. And uh, thank you so much for your kindness. This church supported us for a lot of years as we were in full-time revival work and evangelism. Uh, Cleveland Baptist stood behind us $100 every month faithfully, and uh, I can't tell you what a blessing that was. And uh, every person that was saved as we traveled and served the Lord and uh, tried to have revival, every person that got saved, this church has a part in that, and uh, fruit remains right here as your partnership with us, and uh, we feel like uh, just you're a part of our family, and we thank God for this place. The book of Matthew chapter 7, please, verse number 21, let's stand together for the reading of the Word of God. And I will try to be brief this morning. Someone said a great sermon should have a great beginning, a great ending, and they need to be as close together as possible. But uh, anyway, Matthew chapter 7, please, verse number 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the, what, will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy, in thy name have done many wonderful works? Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and what? Do with them, I will liken him unto a, man, a wise man which built his house upon a rock. The rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a what? And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which has built his house upon the sand, the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. For a few moments this morning, I'd like to preach something that's been on my heart for the last year and a half. It was a theme of our church for last year in 2013 at Granite Baptist. We began to go through a theme together of building your life on something that lasts, on building your, your life on substance that endures. And for a few moments this morning, I'd like to preach simply on the subject of building on the solid rock. Building your life on the solid rock. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for the Word of God. We ask your blessing to reside upon it. We acknowledge today that all is vain, lest the Spirit of the Holy One should come down. So settle in our midst, work among us. I thank you for this great place. I thank you for Pastor Folger and his great leadership and wisdom and the way you've used him here for your glory and honor. Thank you for the legacy of this great church of Cleveland Baptist, we thank you that it has been built upon the solid rock of the Word of God. I pray that you'll bless today, bless tonight, bless throughout the week. Thank you for that which you will do, for it's in Jesus' name we pray, all of God's people said. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing for so long. If you were to go to Israel and begin to go out on the lake of the Sea of Galilee and make your way to a place that is somewhere between Tiberias and Capernaum, 
as you made your way around the lake, you would see a hillside coming up out of that lake of Galilee. Up on that hillside and on the, up top of that hillside is a small church or a chapel called the, uh, the Church of the Beatitudes. And it was built by the Franciscans in 1937. They built it in honor and memorial of the fact that the Lord Jesus had been on that very site, supposedly there near the, uh, the Sea of Galilee, and there on that hillside, as the multitudes gathered together around the Son of God, he preached what we believe is the greatest sermon that ever proceeded out of the lips of any man. Not only was it out of the lips of a man, but of course that sermon came from the lips of a God-man, the God-man, uh, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. As he preached that great sermon uh, called the Beatitudes, where he began with that uh, great uh, truth of blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they which mourn, for they shall be comforted. And gave out those seven or eight Beatitudes, if you will. He, and he came, went through that entire sermon, and the multitudes gathered around. As he came toward the conclusion of that great portion of the Bible, he began to use a number of contrasts to illustrate divine truth and to give us a picture and a window to see into the things of God and the kingdom of God far more clearly. These contrasts are several. He begins in verse number 13 with a broad gate and a narrow gate. He said in verse 13, Enter in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Many there be which go in thereat. Because because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto light, and few there be that find it. He dealt with the contrast between wolves and sheep. He said in verse number uh, six, or verse number 16 or 15 of the same text, he said, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. We are living in a generation of false teaching. We live in a generation of false prophets, and no matter how broad their smile, you know how many times they bat their eyelashes as they preach to you, you better be careful what you listen to on the radio and the television, he said beware of false prophets do I have an amen, he said there was a great difference between wolves and sheep, between a wide gate and a narrow gate, he dealt with another great contrast between grapes and thorns in verse number 16 he said you shall know them by their fruits, do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles. The primary emphasis was that you need to know what the fruit of their life is in order to know what they are and where they stand. Uh, we've been in the South many times and I remember the first time I looked out uh, of the window of a hotel and there were these orange spheres growing out on a tree. I don't know why. I, I was raised near the city of Baltimore. I mean, uh, a apples to me were bricks. Amen. I, I mean, I didn't know a thing about horticulture and all that and I, I looked out and I said wow uh, look at that tree look at those orange things gathered out there on that tree and my wife said yeah honey that's an orange tree I said well uh, really do they grow on trees I didn't know that I thought they just grew in the supermarket amen but I mean uh, there were these orange trees out there I looked at it. it was an orange sphere I knew it was an orange there was no mistake when something is red and almost round but not quite and a uh, hanging off a tree. I know it's an apple, an orange. By their fruit, you shall know them. Jesus made this very clear. And then he began to deal in verse number 17 with a contrast between a good tree and a corrupt tree. A good free tree brings forth good fruit. A corrupted tree brings forth evil fruit. By their fruits you shall know them. The last of these contrasts is our text this morning where the Lord begins to deal not only with fruit, not only with sheep and wolves, not only with these other issues of light. He begins to deal with a wise man and a foolish man. How many of you would like to be in the wise man category of light? When 
when God looks upon your life and God categorizes you, you want to be known before God as a wise man, not a foolish man. This wise man and this foolish man uh, both have, I believe, the same uh, given opportunities of life. They both hear the Word of God. They both hear the sermon. They both sit before the preacher. Do you understand that from this pulpit alone, there have been enough sermons and enough preaching and enough teaching to revive ten nations. Amen? Some of the greatest preachers uh, in, this, in this last hundred years have stood behind this pulpit. Your former pastor and other great men of God who stood behind this pulpit. Your pastor who preaches faithfully every week and gives out good doctrine in the Word of God with great passion and, and a love for God's Word. You've had some of the greatest preachers that I could ever name from a pulpit such as this and yet some people come to church and leave unchanged. Others come and say, God, I want everything that you have for my life. I want to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want the Word of God to dwell in my life richly in all wisdom. Now this foolish man, if you study your Bible, the, God said here that he is a man who built his house, verse 26, the, this foolish man, he built his house upon what? He built it on the sand. We used to go down to Ocean City when we were kids, and that was a big highlight of the year. I remember as a kid growing up, we didn't have air conditioning in the car. We didn't have air conditioning in the house, amen? There wasn't any air conditioning, uh, so to speak. And uh, we had an old Studebaker. Uh, it was a, just a big old nasty-looking car, and it was so ugly that we called it the Wild Mouse. It was named after an old roller coaster ride in Gwyn Oak Park in Baltimore, Maryland. It looked just like the Wild Mouse. We were kids, we all got in. How many remember the days when you didn't have to buckle up? Amen? We didn't have child restraints. We didn't have safety devices. We threw the kids in wherever they would fit, and the trunk would work if nothing else. Amen? But uh, we'd all get in the car and fight over who would be the last one because the last one had to sit up under the glass in the back, and uh, it was like lay laying under a magnifying glass just frying, and usually being the smallest and the littlest brother, that's where I would end up. I remember we get to Ocean City, though, when uh, once we got to the ocean, Ocean, all that was forgotten. We'd dive in right away. We'd be fired up to be at Ocean City, and then my brothers and me would start madly and frantically starting building castles out in the sand. Now, brother, we didn't just build a little castle. We didn't build and take a little bucket. We had five-gallon buckets with us. We had all kinds of stuff. We had cities built by the time the week came by. We'd tell people, get out of the way, put up all kinds of stuff around. Don't walk in our little area. We'd have a little city. Have a little Italian section, amen. Uh, we'd have it all set up, have little mafia men in there uh, with guns, and uh, we had a, a little city all set up, and this was Little Italy, and over here was everybody else, and uh, we'd be set up with our little city and fired up by the end of the day and start whatever we do. We might have a western town one day and have cowboys and Indians fighting. We might have little army men one day and have us against some other nation, and of course, we always won. That's what I like about it. That's why I'm a Ravens fan. But anyway, uh, we'd move right along, and uh, we'd, all, you know, we'd always win no matter what and had a great time. But the next morning, we'd come back, and after a good high tide, what would be there? Absolutely nothing would be left. There'd be very little evidence of the fact that we had labored all day long. By the end of the week, we had shovels. We had, I mean, we, we were serious about building our little sand cities over there by the beach. But they were built on sinking sand and when the tide came in, when the waves came in, they were broken down and dashed and we had to start all over again. Jesus likened that, uh, that same thing to a man who builds his life, who hears the word of God, who ignores the Bible in his life and this foolish man because of that when the waves come when the rains descend, when the floods came, this man, his house, falls because it was built on sand. Now understand, if you study the Bible, you'll find some things about this foolish man and the wise man. Are you still here this morning? Amen. You won't hurt me a bit if you say amen. Not ahead, 
blink or something. Amen? And uh, it, it won't hurt me at all. Uh, if you sort of look like you're awake, some of us just need to sit up a little bit. Some One man looked and leaned over. His wife nudged him and said, hit me again. I can still hear him. But anyway, uh, try to stay awake in the house of God. And so this foolish man, this foolish man, so, uh, there are several things I see about his life. Number one, he's disobedient. He said, he that heareth the word and doeth them. That was the key. Jesus was looking for people who would obey the word of God. But this foolish man, he hears the same teaching, he hears the same sermon, and he said, everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man. How many of you believe this? The Bible says that you and I are to be uh, doers of the word and not hearers only. God said in the book of Titus chapter Chapter 3, we ourselves also are sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures. I believe that America has become obsessed with learning, but we're ever learning, and I'm afraid, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. I'm so glad when I see a good old boy get saved by the grace of God. He might not look like much. I can name a lady in our church, and if you saw her, you'd probably run and grab your children and run and hide. She got saved recently, and God is working in her life. She doesn't look like much. Uh, man, her, her clothing is rough. Her attire is rough, but she comes into church with her Bible and uh, sits on the second row and says, Praise the Lord, Pastor. She'll talk right back at me while I'm preaching. And it's better than nothing, amen. But, uh, I mean, she'll, she'll talk right back and say, Praise the Lord, that's really good. But she'll come in and talk to my wife and say, Miss Susan, guess what I did? I quit listening to this. Guess what, Miss Susan? I just quit smoking. And, uh, man, it's awesome. Every week she quits smoking, amen. But and, uh, it's great and she does it again and again but at least she's trying to make a difference in her life I've just seen an old staking old boy who's rough off the street he doesn't look like much he doesn't know Genesis from concordance he thinks Malachi is an Italian prophet named Malachi and uh, he has no idea what the Bible says or what the Bible is but he's coming he's listening he's growing and as he obeys God he is building his life on a solid rock and God is working his heart but understand hearing the word and not doing God said we're disobedient secondly the foolish man is deceived he said this person is deceiving his own self that's why so many times throughout the Gospel of Matthew, the Lord Jesus constantly reminds his disciples to beware of falsehood, beware of false teaching. He said in verse number 15, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. Some people are magnets for uh, falsehood. Some people are magnets for deception. Why? Because they just don't want to obey the plain old truth of the Bible. How many of you believe God wants every Christian to go soul winning? Let's try that again. How many of you believe God wants every Christian to go soul winning? Amen. Every Christian to read the Bible every day? every Christian to spend time in prayer, every Christian to separate from the world and be different, and yet why are so many uh, having have such a hard time with this? Because they're looking for some new way out, some easy fix. May I suggest to you that there's no magical zap that the preacher can give you on the forehead. There's no words that some evangelists can say, be hail, amen, and everybody's changed and everybody's good, and no matter, I don't care what Dr. Broadjaw does, Dr. Wiggleworm, Dr. Feelgood says to you, you can have your best life now. You can say all that, but I'm telling you, there's nothing like putting one spiritual foot in front of the other and every day walking with God and obeying God with your life. Deception follows if we don't. He is disobedient. He is deceived. This man is not only disobedient and deceived, this foolish man eventually is destroyed. And this man, because he built his life on this sand, because he built his life on fluff, if you will. I like uh, emotions. I'm an Italian. I get fired up about everything. I cry about stuff. Oh, I'm always crying and always excited about this and that. But emotions will never keep you through life. God wants character in our life, not just feelings. Amen? 
I, I don't usually wake up jumping out of bed and saying, praise the Lord, it's another day. Let's pray. Hallelujah. It's not like that. Do I have an amen? Some of you know that life is it's getting difficult for you. You get up in the morning, first you've got to find your glasses. Then you've got to put on your hearing aids. Then you have to go into the other room and start taking all your meds. Then you have to drink two or three cups of coffee, amen, and, uh, and just get going. Then you have to get some, uh, some, you know, some whatever it is, uh, icy blue or whatever, and put all over your joints just to get going. You know, by the time you do all that, it's time for a nap, amen. But, I mean, that's to start the day off. We don't just jump out of bed, hallelujah, you're going to pray all day, glory. It's not like that. Uh, serving Christ is saying, I know I need the Bible. I know I need prayer. I know we need God. I know this old flesh will fail us every time. And deception always leads to, listen, destruction. Amen. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly, suddenly be destroyed. That without remedy, Proverbs 29.1. Ask your pastor about the casualties he's seen through life. Ask him about the people that he's had in his office in the last seven days who are going through calamity and don't know why it occurred. And you ask your pastor to be honest because he, he needs to be careful. He needs to be veiled in his comments and say, well, I'm praying for you, but deep down inside, he knows that he has run right into the iceberg of the Word of God. She has run right into the iceberg of the Word of God, and the iceberg, just like the Titanic, the Titanic said, we can knock an iceberg out. Guess where the Titanic is? It's under the ocean. It's sunk because you cannot run into God's holy Word and live. Do I have an amen? Destroyed because of a lack of doing. The Word of God. Now, God gives another contrast here, and it's not the, the foolish man, but he's the wise man. He heareth the Word. Let's look at it, please. In verse number 24, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and what? Let's try that again. He heareth these sayings of mine, and what? He doeth them. That's why God did say, be doers of the word. And here's a man who says, by the grace of God, I'm not only going to delight in the Bible, where God said in Psalm 119, verse 97, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. But not only is he going to delight in the Bible, but he's going to do the Bible every day of his life. You say, what uh, Bible are you talking about? Well, the sayings of Jesus. He said that, blessed are they which mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be miserable for the rest of their life. Is that what God says? He said, if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, what's going to happen? We're going to be what? filled. We're going to be happy. We're going to be able to walk with God and serve Him. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and, say, and persecute you. Say all things uh, falsely against you for, when I, for my name's sake. Rejoice, be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. And He gives us God's pattern and God's blueprint for life. The only question is, will we follow it? Will we obey it? Now, God said in 2 Peter 1, you don't need to turn there, but in verse 4, God said, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience. How many of you today need patience? How many of you need patience right now? Say, hurry up, get this sermon all. I've already seen some of you look at your watch three times. I get it, all right? I'm hurrying. And so add to your, to, to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness. And God said, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to grow. 
We're going to be what God wants us to be. We're going to serve Him if we learn what it means to uh, live our lives, to add to our faith these wonderful qualities and virtues of God, to build a life on the solid rock. Now I'll need to close because I want you to come back tonight. But I'll give you three or four things that God wants every wise man to do and every one of us to build our life upon. When we build on the solid rock, we live our life by foundational principles. We're learning what it means to memorize and study and live by the Word of God. How many of you believe this? That God's Word shall never pass away. That God's Word is true. And so the foundational principles of the holy, inspired, infallible Word of God. Man, you can love the evangelist. You can love your visiting speaker. You can say, man, we, we love this guy and that guy. Those things are awesome, and I believe in all that. But understand, it's going to have to be a life that is built on the holy, inspired, infallible Word of God and on the very God who wrote it. David said, He only is my rock and my salvation. He only is my defense. I shall not be moved in Psalm 62.6. Foundational principles, secondly, if we're going to build on solid rock, we're going to have to have a fixed position. A fixed position. I know what I believe. I already know where we stand. You don't have to ask me about it. Don't even ask. I'm already against it. Amen to that? I mean, I'm against bubble gum. Not really, but I've tried to find something wrong with it. And I'm saying that uh, I'm just going to stay with what the Bible says. I've had kids come up in Bible college and say, Hey, Brother Rossi, uh, you know, are you still against uh, this kind of music? I said, just, Would you just look at me and tell me what I think? Okay, never mind. I mean, uh, I'm staying. And that's what Paul said. He said, None of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. He said, I've stayed in a certain spot and been what God wants. There's something about just staying on the principles of the Holy Word of God. Amen. And this generation is carried about by every wind of, man, uh, wind of doctrine and slight of men, a generation that's always out for some new thing. There's nothing like just keeping on going with what God said to do and keep on doing it every week, every month, every year. Faithfulness is not measured in weeks, months, or even years. It is measured and gauged by decades. Do I have an amen? Decades of serving Christ. That's why I love this church. This church still stands on the Word of God. This church is still still reaching out to young people and getting people saved. This church still supports worldwide missions and stands on God's truth. The buildings are uh, they're new and improved, they're brighter, they're nicer, but we stand in the same spot and we still glorify God. I'm glad when I came here this morning that Pastor Folger didn't say, oh, I forgot to tell you about our new rock and roll band that's playing. He probably wouldn't have had me here if he did, but uh, he knows I'd preach about it. But anyway, I'm saying I'm glad for a place that's standing on the Word of God, a fixed position, foundational principles. Thirdly, a followed plan. You know that God has a plan for your life? He has a plan for every area of your life. He's got a blueprint, if you will. And if we'll just live by it and give our lives to it, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord. God has a plan uh, for your faith of how to grow and be what God wants. He's got a plan for your family and how to raise your family for the glory of God. And he's got a plan for your finances of how to spend your money and how to be a steward with what God has given us. And God has a plan for your future and for mine. You know, God has a good plan for you. Amen. Let's try that again. I said God has a good plan for you. Amen. Why? Because he's a good God. And we know, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, we might not see it right now in this small space of life that we're in. You might not see it in the trial that you're in the middle of at this moment of life. But the Bible said, and we know, not think or hope, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and that are the call according to His purpose. And God, His plan is very, very good for your life and for mine. So you're 21 years old. 
Pastor Rossi, I'll never find a guy, so I guess I just better go out and date some boy that's not saved or some boy that's out here in the world and because uh, there's no Christian boys. Yeah, there is a shortage of good men, but you only need one. Amen. Do I have an amen? <laughs> He said, I don't see any. You might not see them. But if you keep serving God and being faithful, you'll finally meet one. You big old strong strapping guy will come walking here and say, hi. Hi there. How are you? Nope. Wrong one. But anyway, I mean, you'll find the right guy if you wait on God who actually acts like a man, looks like a man, and even talks like a man. Amen. I think we ought to have voice deepening exercises in all Bible colleges instead of, hi, Brother Rossi. How are you? Uh, that's a whole nother sermon. But anyway, we'll move right along here we ought to have a followed plan the blueprints of God for your life in 2nd Timothy 3 16 God said all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is what profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect thoroughly furnished unto all good works and so there's a followed plan a fixed position, foundational principles, and if you're going to build on the solid rock, there needs to be some faithful patience that you display with your life. You know that you can go out here and take two seeds and one of them will grow very fast and the other will not. You can go out here this spring when the, if the weather ever gets warm around this place. Every time I come, it's freezing came here two meetings ago and had a broken shoulder and was all messed up. pastor reminded me of that today. He said, you remember that? I said, I don't remember a thing. I was on drugs, amen? <laughs> and uh, I was trying to sell Percocets out at the book table, but uh, <laughs> nobody would take them. But uh, I mean, it was rough. It was a tough time. And we had on top of that a sub-zero record-setting cold snap. But we still had church. Amen. And people still came out. And I love, I love that and I love this place for it. But I mean, you understand that I was thinking about this when the spring finally arrives and everything starts to bloom a little bit. You can go out in your garden. Boy, you can put two seeds into the ground. You can put one that's going to be a nice summer squash. It'll take a couple of weeks, maybe just a few months, and there it'll be out there, and you can make... Uh, you know, Parmesan, uh, whatever you want to make out of it, some Italian dish, amen, but I mean, there it is, eggplant, Parmesan, and you'll have a summer squash out there. That's wonderful. Takes a few months. You can put another seed into the ground, and you'll look, and there's nothing but a sprig. Nothing much happening there. End of the year, a little something about like this. Winter time comes along, can't even find it. Next year, it's a little bigger. The next year, it's a little bigger. But about 100 years from now, somebody passing by that's steaming hot and on a journey and needs a place to rest can go under and sit down under that mighty oak tree that you built that took not weeks, months, or even years, but it took decades to grow the proper way. Which do you respect more? Which of those two, a summer squash or a tomato uh, plant that withers and dies and the rabbits come along to eat it anyway before you get to them? Or would you rather have a big old oak tree that's got shade, got those, oaks, uh, those acorns dropping off, got that big old 12-point buck that you've been after coming over to eat underneath of it? And I'm talking about something that's lasting, something that's durable, something that is built on a root system that lasts something that's built on solid rock. Noah, by faith, being warned of things not warned of God, of things not seen as yet, he moved with fear and prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Not one year, not two years, not three. Not one generation, not two generations, but three generations later. At 120 years, after that man of God faithfully labored, faithfully gave himself, faithfully served, endured the mocking, the ridicule, the humiliation, one day when the rains came and the floods came from heaven and the fountains of the deep broke up and the world became a great deluge, there was one man who would build his house on something lasting. 
There was one life that said, we'll be there when everything falls apart. And understand, I believe that man had built his house on the solid rock. Which rock are you building on this morning? Are you building on his? Are you building on sand? Are you the foolish or are you the wise? Let's bow our heads, please, and our hearts together for prayer this morning.